topic that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, and um, really what I'm gonna share with you is an accumulation of not just experiences over my time in different organizations and different industries, um, but also uh, mentorship along that path and on that experience, as well as some key influencers whose content um, really shaped this thinking and uh, forms the foundation of more of a template and tools that I think we can all use um, to ensure that as we're, we're tasked with tracking down different levels of performance or results, whether we're individual contributors currently um, and how we contribute or we're in leadership roles or whatever our role is on the team, um, we're all tasked with um, different performance expectations. And so this really helps us um, be able to um, follow a template and work towards something that's pretty well defined, I believe. So um, we're gonna jump into the topic of anatomy of results. Um, my hope is, is that this will empower you in your pursuits towards delivering results against expectations wherever you are. If we jump in, there's really four key elements um, that come to life when it, we talk about the pursuit towards results. There's this foundational, foundational element that we call defining our current reality and defining it honestly. And we'll dive into each of these in more depth um, throughout the presentation today. But then you've also got to make sure that you understand where you're going. That's commonly known as vision and goals. And how do we go about intentionally planning um, a clear vision and trajectory towards where we want to go? The next one is um, one that I don't think gets talked much about. I think it makes sense when we bring it up, but it's one that um, I don't hear in business or in, in other uh, areas, social circles even, folks talking about this one as much, but it's about fortifying, fortifying state of mind. So how do we show up um, where we are, whether it be within a team again or as an individual contributor? And then lastly, act, which is essentially what we do um, and how we go about actually executing whatever it is we're pursuing. And so as we dive into this even deeper, the biggest piece around defining reality is figuring out what truth is. I can tell you I've been on a many, many teams and many, many um, environments where the most challenging piece is trying to understand our position and where we are. And it, it reminds me of what a mentor shared with me along my path when I was pretty young. He said, you know, Chad, the, the hardest thing to do is make sure that you know exactly what truth is. And this mentor said, the worst lies are the lies we tell ourselves. We live in the denial of what we do, even what we think. We do this because we're afraid to move. And that took me a while to understand what he was getting at in that moment. But what I realized was this, too many people define reality based on comfort. So whatever makes me feel safe and secure is how I want to define my reality. And I've seen a lot of individuals do this, I've seen teams do this, but I think one really, really good example is when you think of companies that have done this. And so the company that comes to mind every time I think about defining reality and not lying to ourselves is the example of Kodak. I'm sure many of you know who Kodak is or has heard of Kodak. For those who don't, Kodak was a uh, film production and camera production company that started back in 1888. And the company actually dissolved in 2013, went through bankruptcy, Reemerged out of bankruptcy with still a Kodak name intact, but the company was really divested and wasn't really the same company that they were at the time. And so the question that I ponder, and I think the question that this group should ponder and others should ponder when, when something like that happens, is how can a company that has survived over 120 plus years, all of a sudden looking at themselves in a position where they, they aren't able to thrive and they aren't able to, to survive. What happened there? 
And if you read kind of the autopsy of what happened with Kodak and you look at it over time and, and you hear it from the executives and the, the individuals making decisions in that company, what they will tell you is this. They'll tell you, you know, we were the company that actually discovered digital photography. We were actually the company that innovated and pioneered um, what a new future, what a new reality could be for our company. But we were so beholden to our comfort zone and we were so beholden to what um, was something that we felt we just needed to continually optimize and enhance and develop, which was, you know, the roll film and the Polaroid type uh, picture film. And essentially, even though they had the, the, the innovation that would have propelled them forward to a different outcome, a different result, a different level of performance, they buried it and put it on the shelf because essentially they lied to themselves. They weren't looking at their reality for what it was and defining it with truth and honesty. So then as I look at examples like that, and many of you on this call could probably think of companies here even in the last five years, 10 years, that have had similar journeys. If you look at you know, the, the world of retail um, and Amazon's impact, if you look at um, even airline industries or other industries that have had impacts where they weren't able to navigate it, you really can start to pull back the layers of the onion and get to a place where at some point in that journey, people weren't being truthful with a real honest assessment about the world that they were operating and living in. And so then the question becomes, if that's a risk factor, and that's something that can prevent us from moving forward and achieving the results that we hope to achieve, how do we not fall into that trap? What's the protection against that? How do we make sure that we're being honest with ourselves? And that brings me to these four points that I, I really encourage the teams that work for me um, and that have worked for me in the past to really be intentional about and focus on. And where, where I operate currently at FBI, we actually do this more than once a year. I think the, the right cadence is probably two to three times a year but we're always honestly defining our reality um, and toll gating if what we thought was real is still real based on different dynamics. And those different dynamics are right here. I like to start at the individual level. And so I like for people to define who they are with honesty first. Um, I'm sure many of you on this call have heard about um, you know, Myers-Briggs or disc profiling or strength finders, all of those individual assessments. I think all those things are great starting points to try to help an individual understand and drive towards who they are, what their DNA is, how they are gifted, how they respond during times of stress or not, um, and what brings an individual energy. I like to encourage my team and even myself to do mostly what I like to do. <laughs> I find that things that come intuitively and naturally to me are the areas that I like to spend most of my time in. And so if individuals can start to get really honest and define that for themselves, um, they can start to really influence um, their bosses, their teams, um, to be able to operate and behave and function in those areas that they actually naturally get energy from and operating in, and it really even starts to influence career pathing. The other areas you see here, are what are current state internal dynamics? And what I mean by that is if you take the ecosystem of wherever we all work, um, my company happens to be FBI buildings, um, others on this call may be um, in other industries or other teams, but whatever that ecosystem is internally, what is the current state of those internal team dynamics? What are the current state of the external dynamics? What's going on outside of the four walls of where I function that could either help or hinder my progress towards results? 
And where am I actually even trying to go? How would I even define success based on what I'm trying to achieve? And I found that these assessments um, represented here on this slide um, are some of the absolute best assessments to synthesize those four topics. Um, the first one you can see up on the upper left is all about self-awareness and cloverleaf. This is, this is the individualized um, side of being honest with who you are as an individual or who I am as an individual. And uh, Rebecca, I don't know if you're able to pull up the cloverleaf link at this time, but that would be great if so. Perfect. Um, what Cloverleaf does, they're a pretty innovative company. And what Cloverleaf does is it takes all of this, all of these individualized assessments. You can see there in the middle where it says behavior Enneagram. Um, this is actually my individualized um, assessments. This is Enneagram is just another assessment that helps you understand who you are. And, uh, Rebecca, if you click on that number eight, the challenger there on that black bar, it opens up and it'll tell you things about yourself um, that can either be validating or can be um, maybe even cause you to pause and say, man, I didn't really know that was me. And then over to the right, you've got the 16 types, the behavior. I'm an extroverted. I've got intuition. I like to think and judge. So if you click on the executive there in the black box, um, yeah, that one gives you more. It says ENTJs are charismatic leaders. And if you scroll down then on this, this web page that Cloverleaf has developed, all of these are just individual assessments that help you triangulate um, from different perspectives, whether it be a personality perspective, whether it be a strength-based perspective, um, whether it be a cultural perspective, how I was born and raised and um, what values were instilled in me in my upbringing. That's kind of that cultural motivating values one down there in the bottom center. Um, and then what they do is if you scroll back up, Rebecca, they do some really cool things around um, the, the top left there under daily coaching tips. Like if, I, if you click on leadership, for instance, um, it'll say, Help your team to explore solutions to each unique situation by emphasizing the approach of curiously asking questions rather than command and control because my default can be command and control. So in order to bring a team along, I may need to do um, this coaching tip in my next meeting in order to help myself be successful towards results. But all of this information can be a lot for a person to take in. But if you go to Cloverleaf, you can take one assessment at a time. And what it will do, it'll galvanize your convictions around who you really are and what you do really, really well and what comes naturally to you. And I would just encourage you to find a, find a role within an organization that allows you to do just that, to be you, how you were, how you were born and created and, and what, what your DNA is, um, allow you to function with your strengths and with your giftedness. And so if um, we bounce back here to um, some of the other, let's see if I can get this to bounce back. I think it's, there we go. There we go. Hopefully everybody's got me now. If we bounce back here, we've got um, the other tools. Cloverleaf is its own individual platform that drives self-awareness and it helps you define honesty within yourself. EQ, the one right below Cloverleaf, EQ, um, these assessments around emotional intelligence, that's what EQ stands for, um, really help an, under, an individual understand not only just emotions and the different range of emotions and the intensities that grow with emotions, but it actually helps individuals self-examine um, whether or not they're good self-managers of emotions or if emotions kind of control them. It also helps individuals understand how they perceive or intuit emotions from another individual and how they can um, 
understand those emotions in order to um, understand the people that they work for within their team and um, provide counsel and behavioral responses back to those team members that are healthy versus destructive. Um, and that's a really powerful tool. I found that there's, there's, no other, there's no other metric or measurement that, it, that tells me what an individual's potential is as far as growth potential within an organization or company to actually truly lead others and lead through others like an EQ assessment. That's why I put current ceiling. It really helps me understand what an individual's possible ceiling is. So if, if you're wanting to learn more about yourself, Cloverleaf and EQ assessments are where I would steer you. And I think they'll help you get to a place of honesty so that you're not lying to yourself about yourself. Um, the other area where we define reality honestly is in team dynamics. And that's what the middle two represent. Depending on where you are within your personal journey on your team, whether you've just joined an organization for two or three or four or five years, you've probably seen these different stages play out where a team's either forming, storming, norming, performing, or adjourning. This is called the Tuckman model from Bruce Tuckman, and many of you have probably seen it. Um, I think that what individuals on this call should always be striving for within your teams or nudging the teams that you work on towards is really just trust and building um, really healthy, trusting atmospheres. Once you can do that, um, really honestly, hierarchy and rank and organizational structure becomes much less important because you can become much more nimble and just move and go because you're not kind of questioning motives or why somebody's posturing or positioning a certain way. Um, it, it truly becomes a place where you're in it to get in it, in it together and growing together and going after it together. So, um, but it's good to know from an honest assessment what stage you're in. So is the team forming, storming, norming, performing, or adjourning? And you can use that as a tool to define your team dynamics, honestly. The bottom one is an internal talent assessment that we call this a PPA grid. It's for performance and potential. Um, it talks about just individuals. So this is like a talent inventory assessment. You can do it on your own. You can do it to yourself. Um, and you can also do it um, against others and looking at where you think others may fit. Um, are they a high performer with high potential? Are they a low performer with low potential? Are they a medium performer with medium potential? A high performer um, with uh, low potential? Um, and they then you can then start to understand the dynamics and makeup of your bigger, broader team. Um, we do this here at FBI as an organizational thing. Um, you've got over, you know, 200 and some employees and 200 and some team members um, working together. And it's good to have a way to really truly inventory your talent. And we really believe that talent is our number one asset here. So this is another tool that helps us be able to say, yep. We, we're in the right spot with talent or, hey, we're, we're a little bit off the mark here with talent and it keeps us honest and it keeps us um, in conversation um, and, and honest dialogue perpetually. The last two over here to help define bigger, broader dynamics. So many of you have probably heard of a SWOT analysis. I think ex internal and external honesty is important to define what are your strengths what are your opportunities? So those are pretty self-explanatory, but those, those move more towards the internal dynamics of the ecosystem that you function within. And then the weaknesses and threats focus on the external side of, um, of the dynamic. And so as you're looking at it, you gotta be able to say, hey, we're really good at this and we can seize on our strengths in the marketplace and focus on these opportunities um, that present themselves because of our core competencies. Um, and then there's also good to recognize, hey, we're a little weak um, in our operations or in our business development pursuits or even in our own abilities. And that can pose potential threats if a competitor comes along that's stronger than us. Um, and so what competitors are there in our marketplace that could possibly threaten or disrupt us and beyond competition, that's what the last one down here is, this marketplace disruption called PESTLE. There's other potential opportunities or threats 
tied to a pestle analysis, which is really your um, political, economic, social, technology, technology, technological, um, environmental, and legal disruptors. So is there any is there anything coming through Congress through legislation? Is there anything in the environment due to weather that's going to shift my business? And so we really try to keep our, ourselves honest using all of these tools and we're constantly defining our reality. And that's the type of rigor, discipline, time, effort, and energy that we're perpetually putting in to what sounds like a simple topic at, at the outset of simply being honest and real with yourself. But I, I, I've seen too many teams not take it to this level and they find themselves out of position and off the mark like Kodak did um, ultimately. And that's no position any individual, team, or company wants to find themselves in if they can prevent it. And I think these are just really proactive tools and ways to make sure that you are defining reality with integrity and with honesty. And so as we move from the realm of defining reality, honestly, and once we've done that together in our pursuit towards results, the next step is, okay, what's our real vision? How are we going to define success? What are we going to communicate to ourselves as individuals, to our teams, and to the bigger team um, and the broader team about what success actually looks like? And I don't know how many of you know this guy. His name's Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, he's a pretty fascinating mind. He's definitely an influencer um, for me and the content that he puts out. Um, he is truly a serial entrepreneur. Um, he's got more energy than I can think of. Um, but I think he has a really simple way to look at when you're going into your organizations and what's your starting point for defining what success looks like, I think he communicates a really simple way to go about rethinking and redefining um, what goal setting and vision setting um, should look like and be about. And so I will apologize, I got a video for you here and he does, he does use a little bit of language in the video. So if you've got it, if you're offended by, um, you know, cuss words or anything like that. There are a couple in this video, but the point I think is pretty, uh, pretty emphatic that he makes and pretty, pretty good. So I'll have Rebecca pull up that video if we can go ahead and play that for the group here, Rebecca. I want to put real pressure on the framework, on the concept, on what's actually happening here, which is. We are living through a transitional, transformative technology known as the internet. It is now finally 25 years old and mature. Everybody has it. Everybody has it all the time. And the whole world is getting flipped upside down. And you have an opportunity to take a piece of it. The problem is everybody wants to take the whole piece. Everybody's like, Gary, I'm gonna build the next Twitter or Uber or Facebook. Everybody's gonna build a billion dollar company. News alert. You're not building a billion dollar company. How about just building a company that you like and makes you happy? How about just doing something you like every day? Everybody's got to, right? Like, how about that? How about people in here realizing that they have a job that might pay them a little bit more than something else, but they hate it, but they're not willing to live in a more humble home or drive a more humble car, and so they have a miserable job just to pay for shit that they have to impress other people that they don't even like. How about that fucking conversation? It has never been easier, I'm, and I don't like using the word easy, but I'm gonna say it, it has never been easier to make $100,000 a year because of this. The problem is everybody thinks you have to make a billion, and the problem is nobody has humility to live a $100,000 lifestyle. I think we have to change the conversation in our society. Not in Southeast Asia, not in Malaysia, not in America, Seven billion people need to change the conversation of what success looks like. It is not 
to make a billion dollars, it is to actually wake up in the morning and be in a good mood. And whether that is me, who loves the game of entrepreneurship so much that he goes so hard every day because he just loves what he does, or if it's somebody who only wants to work 25 hours a week because they, all their other passions are so interesting to them and that's what is good for them, we have to allow for everything. We have to allow for everything because everything is true and everything is real. And you need to figure out, my biggest fear of my popularity is that you think you have to do it like me. The only hope I have when you look at me is that you try to figure out your version of you that makes you as happy as my version of me makes me. I wanna remind everybody here, I'm 43 years old, which means when I loved entrepreneurship in America, nobody else did. It was not popular, only school. So I loved this thing before it was this thing. And guess what? When the economies collapse, everybody's gonna go off of entrepreneurship and go back to a job, and I'm gonna still love this thing when it's not as cool as it is today. When there isn't sneakers and fans, I'm gonna still like it because it's mine. I've always done it and I always will. You need to figure out that for you. Not what your parents think, not what I think, not what the comments think, you. So what I love about that message is it empowers us as individuals to chart our own courses. And so when we were talking about that here at FBI, we said taking Gary's challenge there to heart around what would make us happy? You know, is it tons of profit? Is it tons of um, just brand recognition or what is it? And ultimately what we came back to is our leadership team said, we genuinely want to build better lives for our customers, for our team members, for each other. And we want to enjoy the journey along the way in doing that. So what does building better lives mean? Well, it means that we're going to have to continue to innovate and create. We're going to have to take care of our customers' concerns around quality and efficiency and meeting their deadlines and schedules. And so it brought it back into the business, but it really kind of focused in on um, a vision that goes year over year over year that just continues to be part of that um, approach to how we're going to go about building better and better lives for our team members and for our customers and our employees. And I would just encourage anybody on this call to ponder that question simply around, you know, what's going to make me happy? Like, what am I going to get out of bed excited to do and go push and strive and, and, and chart a course towards? And so obviously in order to build towards some of those things, you know, money's fuel and you got to have profits to grow and, you, there's probably certain compensation levels, levels people desire, but defining that and knowing exactly what it is, it's going to be, be something that not only you personally are hungry for, but also those around you are hungry for, and defining it together um, really ties back to whether or not it simply makes you happy. And um, I think that the challenge is a great one. I love it. I love the, the thought of people not becoming too greedy. Um, and being able to, to push towards a vision in that way. The other thing I would just challenge the group on here is you think about setting a vision of where you're trying to go or planting a flag of where you're trying to go is that your vision for success should be a little challenging and even a little bit scary. Um, it should be something where you even maybe doubt if you can achieve it. Um, but I'll tell you what, it, it, if it's something that you think you can achieve, if you push really, really hard, you'll push really, really hard. And what I love about the push is exactly what this chart reflects. It forces us all out of our comfort zones. Um, it pushes past the fear, the doubt, um, the I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can chase down that profit goal. I don't know if I can actually take on that much of a workload. Whatever the actual goal is you're trying to achieve, it forces growth into the learning zone or forces you past fear into the learning zone where you've actually got to then figure stuff out that's foreign 
in a known, and that's actually what growth is, is putting those new tools into your skill set and really understanding and defining more and more who you are. I've had more and more people in my career say, you pushed me really hard and I didn't like you at the time when you were pushing towards that goal or towards our goal as a team. Um, but man, I grew a ton through that and through that I actually really, really respect that part of the journey. And, and I really want to try to challenge individuals to not necessarily need a mentor or a boss to be the one that pushes, but to set goals that are a little bit scary um, that forces growth um, individually and as an individual. This um, last area I want to talk about here is all about um, state of mind before you get into the more simple action of just acting upon what you've built. If you've defined reality and you've cast the right vision and goal, this one comes, this one's all about how you show up then every day after you've planted that flag. If you know where you want to go, this is about working on your mentality and your mindset. And this guy's name is Eric Plantenberg, and he actually is a doctor who studies um, these topics and um, actually has um, influenced me a ton on the topic of anatomy of results. And um, if we could, Rebecca, let's go ahead and pull up what he has to say about these rule benders and elite performers who get the best results, best in class results, no matter what their pursuit or industry or focus is. Take Kristen Armstrong, for example. Kristen won the gold medal in the 2008 Olympics. She's a two-time uh, two world champion. Kristen and I have gotten to know each other as I was invited to speak at their spring training camp this year. And I asked the entire team the same question that I just asked you. What percentage does intention, state, and action have on the results you get? What impact is it? So Kristen chimed in right away and she said, you know, Eric, I don't really know about intention and action. I'd have to think about that more. But for me, state is absolutely 60 to 70% of the equation. And I look at all of the different competitors and they all have an intention. They all want to do something. And of course, we're all taking incredible amounts of action, watching our diet, working with our coaches, training, training, training. But a very select group actually stands on the podium. And she said, when I win, I know that what's unique about it is the state that I show up in. And I think that's fascinating considering this is a person that's training for years to compete in an event that takes about 30 minutes. So Dr. Peter Johnson is the director of gynecologic oncology at Aurora Health. He's also a clinical professor at the University of Wisconsin. Basically what Dr. Johnson's done is he's helped pioneer a form of robotic surgery that is now the standard of care in helping tens of thousands of women beat cancer. So in his incredibly impactful career, he'll also be the first to tell you that along this road, in the operating room, many people considered him an incredible jerk. And that it became so severe that he was actually suspended from working with medical students because they were worried that he would taint their experience. So Dr. Johnson and I had the opportunity to spend four days together at a retreat that I lead each spring when he was really sitting with this, quest, this question of intention, state, and action. And I asked him, I said, what really makes you great as a surgeon? Like, what's the essence of it? And what he said didn't surprise me. He, he said, you know, after really considering this, it's humility. It's showing up with the state that I'm there to serve and heal people and that I don't know all the answers and that I don't need to know all the answers. And that's not unique to Dr. Johnson at all. I asked so many physicians about this, and the answer that I'm hearing over and over and over again is that intention is about 30% of the equation. For Dr. Johnson, state is 65%. Different forms of doctors told me, person after person, when asked, what makes you great at what you do? It's things like passion. It's things like genuinely caring, being still and listening to people, which, especially in their profession, is fascinating because after their undergraduate, then they go to medical school, and then they've got their internship, and then these are men and women that most of them have done fellowships. I mean, 15, 18 years of formal education, how much of their education was dedicated towards passion? How much of the curriculum helped them to be more genuinely caring? What they told me 
Zero. And that's not unique to physicians. Look at any line of work. Look at any calling. And most technical training is geared towards things that are not the answer that you came up with at the beginning of this talk. Go back to what you came up with that really makes you great at what you do, and you'll find that it's a state. Top performer after top performer, rule benders, if you will, constantly tell me that state is at least 60% of the equation. Most CEOs that I talk to about their huge global organizations will credit action to 5% to 10% of the ultimate results. So now, I want to be really clear about this. I'm not at all suggesting that actions are not important. Your expertise, your technical training, and certainly all the effort that you put forth, this is incredibly important. What I would say is this is the, com this is the lowest common denominator that re is required for you to be able to do what you do. This is fundamentally a multiplication formula. You're going to take your intention, and you're going to multiply that by your state, and then you're going to multiply that by action. Now, if you don't do anything, you get zero results. So actions are a huge part of this entire equation, but it's not the catalyst to greatness. It's not the catalyst to growth. So often, people try to increase their efforts by doubling their actions, and that comes with collateral damage. It comes with collateral damage to relationships and then to physical health. So if you want to grow, if you really want to take things to a different level, look to state. Look to how you're showing up energetically, and things can really, really shift. So how do you do that? You know, how do you change how you show up energetically? Well, I have tons and tons of ways that people can do this, and I'll suggest that there's three that you can immediately begin doing, and they're three of my favorites. The first one is to hold your intentions lightly. You've got these dreams and you've got these goals, and if you look at people that are bending the rule of norm, what you'll notice is that they have an amazing way to hold on to things lightly while they're chasing after them. Uli Steck showed this to me in the most crazy way on Mount Everest last year. So Uli Steck is regarded by many as the greatest mountaineer on planet Earth. He's certainly the fastest. He set the speed record for climbing the north face of the Eiger in the Alps. Now, this is traditionally a three-day climb. Reinhold Messner set one of the old records at eight hours. Uli Steck set the current record at two hours and 47 minutes. <laughs> It's unbelievable. Go on YouTube and watch him. He literally runs up the north face of the Eiger. <laughs> so a year ago, he set out to climb three 8,000-meter peaks in the Himalaya, Mount Choyoyu, Shishapangma, and then finally Everest, in less than 30 days. Now, Choyoyu and Shishapangma on their own, these are 30-day climbs, and my expedition on Everest took 62 days to get up to the top and down. So he's going to compress 120 days of climbing into 30 days. He successfully climbed the first two, and he's after Everest, and he's totally on track. So when I saw him, it was about an hour after my climbing partner, Scott Patch, and I had stood on the roof of the world. So we were descending about 100 meters below the summit when we first saw Uli, and he writes about this on his website. He said, I was feeling great. I was much stronger than I thought I was going to be, and the suffering wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. And he's climbing all of these mountains without oxygen. He's less than one hour away from doing something that is just mind-bending to just about everybody in the climbing community. And Scott and I watched him turn around. He turned around, not because he didn't know that he could get to the top, but because his feet were getting very cold, and he didn't know that he could get back up to the top without getting frostbite and potentially injuring himself permanently. What he wrote is he said, Mount Everest will always be there. I can come back and climb another day. I mean, that's just truly a world-class perspective. And when you hold on to your goals so tightly, and you hold on to your intentions like they have to happen or nothing else, you squeeze the life out of them. Take the things that you really care about and hold them gently, and just watch what happens. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, <laughs> let's take a look at this. Your focus ultimately determines your state. My good, good friend Roger Seip puts it this way. He says, what you see is what you look for. So I'd love for you, by an honest show of hands, please raise your hands on this one, How many of you have at least one problem in your life today? Can I see the show of hands? <laughs> okay. Good. Now, 
Think about this. How many of you have at least one thing in your life that you're genuinely grateful for that fills your soul? Can I see the show of hands on that? Oh, isn't that awesome? Now, did that feel different to you? Okay, other than the sarcastic laughter on the first question. <laughs> When you focus on gratitude, even for a second, notice how your body reacts. Most of you threw up two hands on the second one. You act quicker. You act with more certainty, and it just feels different. If you have the ability to focus on gratitude, even just for a little bit, and this is a daily practice, you can get massive results. And this really spreads to the people in your life. Focus just a little bit on your state every single day. So what I love about that is it really puts the emphasis on results tying back to how we show up. And I don't know if you've caught that in the clip when Eric was talking about it's a multiplication formula. So if you don't set a vision or a goal, and you got zero percent intention. You're not going to get the result you want. Also, if you don't, if you have all the vision in the world, and you have a super healthy state of mind, but you don't act upon it, you also aren't going to get the result you want. But very, very, very、uh, tethered tightly to those statements also was: if you want to be an elite performer, or if you want to look around your current internal ecosystem. And say, how do I de deliver results that are better in comparison to anybody else that's in my organization or next to me or around me? And you really want to amplify your results. Really, what the studies are telling us, and what the, this study shows, is the best way to amplify results is to put not time so much time into. Honing and developing specifically skill set that is still important and should be done, but where the majority of the effort and energy should go is towards amplifying how we show up. And I can tell you, the teams that I've been on that put the focus and effort and energy there are the ones who collaborate at the highest levels. They are the ones with the most energy to go. Chase down innovations and and build new things. They are the ones who are pushing towards new horizons and setting aggressive goals. And、um, there's just a completely different dynamic that plays out with individuals that are focused on、um, mentality、um, development versus just skill set development. I love this quote from Marcus Aurelius. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. You'll also find better results than your your peers.、Um, if you look at the final element, it is act. This is simply your ability to mobilize. It's your ability to go. It's your ability to get the result. It's the kind of the cherry on top.、Um, I would just say that、um, doing the the simple. Thought of acting requires commitment. It requires accountability. It requires discipline and the ability to influence those that are around you, so that as you're moving and acting, they want to go along for the ride and be a part of of what you're doing and the results that you're obtaining. And so I think you got to grind, but you also got to influence and you got to plant seeds and water those conversations along the way. And then when it's time to go, you go. And so really, the anatomy of results when it comes down to it. It's this. It's what are your intentions? Amplify your state of mind as the biggest priority, and then act. And none of that matters if it's not resting upon the foundation of a truly well-defined, honest reality that's going on in your worlds right now. And I think that if there's intentionality placed into each of these buckets around defining a clear reality, communicating clear goals and vision. Amplifying state of mind and how we all show up—not just an individual on a team, but how how are we going to behave? What are we going to be about here at FBI? One of the things we talk about is you go—you don't get to make fear-based decisions. So you don't get to say, you know, that would probably work, but man, that'd be tough. That's also how Kodak held on to digital 
film and photography for so long, it was, man, that could work, but that's going to take a ton of work, or that's going to be really hard, or that's going to completely reinvent who we are, and that's scary. And so here, part of our state of mind focus is we don't get to make fear-based decisions. We get to measure risk. We get to understand risk, but we don't get to base decisions off of fear to move forward. And that's just a mentality and a mindset we're committed to. We're all, we also, just as Eric talked about, we intentionally focus on gratitude at the top of every one of our meetings. We're talking about what are we thankful for? What team member did something that was super cool this, this week? You know, um, what result came along that was new and fresh that, you know, 12 months ago we didn't think that we could achieve? And we start meetings that way. We start calls that way. And it's an intentional focus on things that we're grateful for. It could be a customer testimonial. We'll play videos of customers who are really pleased with buildings we've built for them. Um, but it's not a laissez-faire approach. It's an intentional approach to being grateful um, on our journey towards our goals. And then there, there's obviously the rigor and discipline of acting. And so with that, um, hopefully I, there was some seeds planted there for you. There was some content or tools maybe that you could leverage. Um, but this is just how, um, this is a belief that's formed for, for me over my 20 years in uh, the different industries I've served and uh, just happy to share it with you today. So if there's any questions or um, any requests for any of the content or tools or information, um, I don't know, Rebecca, if we have any time right now to take any questions or if those just need to be submitted based on time constraints, but whatever. Sure, yeah, we've got about uh, five minutes left. If there's any questions, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat functions in the box. Um, if you'd like a more personalized answer to your questions, you're free to email chat at uh, the email on your screen. Um, this is, like I said, what he, his passion is. So I'm sure that uh, he would love to answer any of your questions on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, so it doesn't currently look like we have any questions. I'll give you guys just a few um, seconds to write any if you are in the middle of writing some. I am going to launch our poll for the moment um, while you guys are writing questions. So let's look. Um, Travis Noose is asking, do you have a favorite book on strategy? It looks or it sounds like uh, your audio is just a little um, we're not able to hear you. Can you say that one more time? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me now? now? It, can you hear me now without a second? No, unfortunately, um, it is cutting out. Sure. Yeah, you can go ahead and chat your or um, chat your answers. So on that um, technology, did wait for us to finish our program before going out. So. We have to be grateful for that. Thank you so much to Chad for giving us great tactics to uh, building our success. And we know that growth is a journey that can be made so much easier with these professional development tools. So I hope everyone here took away a block of success to begin to tackle. Um, do take that poll, please. Just a few reminders for Tippy Connect. Join us next Tuesday for our Adulting 101 event, meeting cool people doing interesting things with Amanda and Jason from 10 in-house. And then additionally, uh, to be Connect is pleased to offer our members, affiliates, and the public a leadership series that meets you where you are by defining who you are. Join us for this four-part series each Thursday in October, and you'll find more information in our follow-up email. If you'd like to rewatch this webinar, you can visit us on our website at tippyconnect.com, or the link will also be in the follow-up email. Go lead confidently, find your success, and have a fantastic Thursday.